were in Jewish monotheism and Christian Trinitarian doctrine, the dialogue of Pincus Lapid and Jürgen Moltmann. Pincus is now looking at why the Jewish response to the Trinity is so different than the Muslim response, and what is it that Jewish thinking anticipated by thinking about the data of the Old Testament long before the Trinity doctrine was formulated by Christian thinkers from around 200 to 375 AD. Well, here's how he looks at it, looking at the history of interpretation of the Old Testament. The mystics of the Kabbalah discovered a trace of the triad already on the first page of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Here stand the three, say the mystics, not, not normative Judaism, he admits. The mystics say, Here stand the three, God's self, God's spirit, and God's word, which in Hebrew is Davar, which later in Aramaic was called Memra, the two ancestors of the still later Greek Logos, as the first revelation of the one God. Johannes Reuchlin, the student of two rabbis and a citizen of the city of Fortsheim, who was the first Christian Kabbalah researcher, went one step further in that already in the second word of the Bible, bara, and God created, that's the Hebrew word for created, he wished to see a stenogram of the Trinity, Beth as an abbreviation for Ben, the son, Resh for Ruach, the spirit, and Aleph, for the Godhead itself, Elohim. So even looking at the Hebrew letters, some have seen mystically this, this, the seed of this idea of a triad or trinity. Here also belongs the so-called Kedusha, or Trishagian, from Isaiah 6, verse 3, where the choir of angels sings, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The entire earth is full of God's glory. This doxology, since time immemorial, has been part of our daily morning prayer and the prayer of 18, which is spoken while standing. It is no wonder, therefore, that this so often repeated threefoldness of the holiness of God had led to a whole wave of quasi-Trinitarian speculation in the fringe groups of Judaism, especially in connection with Ezekiel 3.12, where it says, And the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a large noise as the glory of the Lord raised itself up. The Spirit, the glory, and the Lord's self, say several of the mystics. There you have it, the three manifestations of the Godhead. Something similar happened with the conclusion of the covenant at the foot of Sinai, where, incredibly, it is said of the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. The Targum, the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible, which at the time of Jesus was already widespread throughout the land, could not bring itself to literally repeat this verse, which contradicts all Jewish knowledge of God. And thus it used the circumlocution. They saw kavod, the glory of the Shekinah, the presence of the God of Israel. Here Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer gave a word of admonition, which has become a basic hermeneutical rule, that a basic interpretive rule in Judaism. Quote, Everyone who exegetes or translates literally a word of the Bible is a liar. <laughs> Everyone who adds something to it is, however, a blasphemer. For here, indeed, he indeed makes of the God of Israel a trinity, namely Kavod, glory, Shekinah, and the Godhead itself. Karl Rahner, the famous Roman Catholic theologian, understands the world as God's self-communication so that God meets us in three givens as the Creator, who gives God's self to humanity as the Redeemer, who lets us understand this as grace, and as the Spirit, whose self gives us our yes to God. This understanding of the Trinity has an extraordinary parallel in a Midrash to Exodus 3.14, where likewise the concern is with the self-communication of God in the form of the disclosing of the Lord's name. A Midrash has God answer Moses, who had asked God's name, I will always be named according to my works. As Elohim, I am the judging God. As Lord of hosts, I lead war against the impious. As El Shaddai, I am the God who condemns sins. And as the Tetragrammaton, which we Jews do not speak out loud, 
I am the God of love and mercy. But most of all, it is true that I will be there as the I decide to be there. Let me say that again. I will be there as the I decide to be there. Exodus 3.14 And no human mind may rob God's salvific action of even a fraction of an inch of God's unpredeterminable sovereignty. That's a key th- word, and I don't know that I've ever seen it before. Unpredeterminable sovereignty. So God will be what he wants to be. The Watchtowers even admitted that's the force of the verbs and therefore should be translated more like I shall be what I shall be or I will be what I will be or I will be that, that I will be rather than the static I am. Then Lapid goes on, something similar was said by Rabbi Zalman Schnur of Lodi, the founder of the Lubavitcher dynasty, one of the pillars of Hasidism. He is the knowing one the one known and the knowledge. All these three form in God an indivisible unity, says Schneuer. This is reminiscent of Karl Barth, the Reformed theologian, who spoke of God as the revealer, the revelation, and the being revealed. A final locus classicus, that is, classic statement in triadic thought in Judaism, should be mentioned here, the theophany of Abraham at Mamre. In the words of Genesis 18, And the Lord appeared to him at the grove of Mamre, and as he raised his eyes up and looked, behold, there stood before him three men. And when he saw them, he ran toward them and said, Lord, if I have found grace before your eyes, do not pass your servant by. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why does Sarah laugh? Should something be impossible with the Lord? I will come again at this time next year, and then Sarah shall have a son. Lapid comments, The transition from the number three of the men to the number one of God in this pericope is so frequent and so immediate that the number of rabbinical interpretations of this passage exceeds a dozen. Nevertheless, it appears clear to most of the exegetes that God is manifested here in a triad of men, or as one of the three men, which corresponds to a dynamic monotheism, attempting to bring the manifoldness of the experience of God under a single roof. Particularly interesting here is the commentary of Rabbi Beno Jacob, quote, Then the Lord appeared to him through men, for the closer a human being is allowed to stand to God, the more human are the appearances of God. Let me read that one again, Beno Jacob. Then the Lord appeared to him through men, For the closer a human being is allowed to stand to God, the more human are the appearances of God. And Lapid comments on that, this same intention is also manifested in the Sephiroth doctrine of the Kabbalists, which perceives God only as a dynamic process between ten different levels of the Godhead. It is a doctrine of the manifestations of God, which understands the unity of God as so far above human knowledge that human beings are able to meet their God only in a phenomenological multiplicity. A phenomenological multiplicity. Now, next time we're going to get deeper into the complications that Jews, Jewish rabbis saw in the Old Testament that made a simple view of God, uh, maybe we should better say a view of God's simplicity incompatible with a view of God's infinity. And the deeper you get into Lapid's argument, the more you realize that this is this speculation was predating Trinitarian speculation in Christian circles by at least three or four centuries in the intertestamental period. We're going to link on your screen a discussion we did of Genesis 18 specifically designed to explain this doctrine to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who, of course, have this passage in their New World Translation but think nothing of it, or certainly are not encouraged even to read it, to tell you the truth. So that we'll put that link on your screen and continue our discussion of Jewish monotheism and Christian Trinitarian doctrine next time. <laughs>